Hello and welcome. Um, I'm Monica Broker with Google University and uh, Google University School of Personal Growth. And I'm uh, happy to introduce Dr. Emmett Miller today. Um, he will be speaking on balance, stress, and optimal health. Uh, the title of his talk is Self-Healing Through Mind-Body Medicine. Uh, this is the first talk in our new Personal Growth Speaker Series. The School of Personal Growth develops Googlers as whole human beings, and we offer four curricula, mental development, emotional development, holistic health and well-being, and what we call beyond the self. We have lots of exciting new programs coming up, including our um, new Search Inside Yourself program, which is a, a very successful mindfulness-based emotional intelligence course that was started by Meng. Uh, Dr. Miller's innovative thinking has revolutionized the field of healthcare. He is one of the originators of holistic uh, health and the field of body-mind medicine. He is a physician, scientist, musician, poet, and master storyteller whose multicultural heritage has given him a unique perspective. He is a graduate of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and his practice spans nearly 40 years, during which he has served as lecturer and preceptor, I learned that word today, uh, at Stanford University, the University of California, and other prestigious universities and medical schools. If you ever heard a uh, guided uh, imagery or meditation tape on CD, you have probably benefited from his work. He invented and marketed the first of such programs in 1970, combining music, nature sounds, and his unique voice to produce relaxation and deep healing. His processes and products are used by top health care organizations and health professionals, business people, performers, and elite, elite athletes, including the Olympic team. He is the author of many books, including Deep Healing, which came out, I think, in 1997, and uh, dozens of these audio and videotapes, and you have a folder on your uh, chair. Um, he has always followed the Roman, Roman rule, those who do not believe a thing can be, no, I'm sorry. He has always followed the Roman rule, those who do not believe a thing can be done, should get out of the way of those who are doing it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm sure you will enjoy his humor and intelligence and discover some powerful new tools to balance stress and create health and success. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Emmett Miller. Thank you, Monica. Yeah, and thank you. Okay. Works. Well, I'm. Uh, I'd like to. Thank Monica and then Dr. Trevor, and to thank Google for inviting me to be here. Uh, uh, speaking on stress is something I've done for a long time, but I, I realized that this was going to be a special occasion when my secretary told me last week that nearly half of the people who will be witnessing my talk are actually going to be laid off within the month. But then it turned out that wasn't really Google, that was a different, com different company. <laughs> they told me that I had to get people's eyes out of their computers, and Meng put me up to it. <laughs> okay, so I'll take you to a uh, little scene. It's a dark night. It's out on the uh, ocean. It's very stormy, very foggy. Uh, the captain's out on the bridge of the ship, and he looks off into the making out through the, through the mist. He sees a little light, and he's getting closer and closer. So he turns to a signalman, and he says, a signal to change your course 10 degrees north. Signal, change your course 10 degrees north. And he waits, and the little light flinks back. Change your course 10 degrees south. The guy says, I said, I'm a captain. Change your course 10 degrees north. Captain, United States Navy, change your course 10 degrees north. Light flashes back. Seaman first class, change your course 10 degrees south. He says, signal, I'm a battleship. Change your course 10 degrees north. Light flashes back. I'm a lighthouse. Change your course 10 degrees south. A stressful experience for the captain. But what's the source of that stress? 
What was the source of that stress? Can anybody tell me? Expectation, exactly. There was a different way he could have approached it where it wouldn't have been that same level of stress. So we talk about stress. When I talk about stress, what comes up for you? What is stress in your mind? So it's volunteers. Louder, please. A physical reaction. Having a physical reaction. OK, good. Someone else? The unexpected. The unexpected. What else? What is stress? And something that's unwanted. Good. More? Disharmony. Disharmony. Mm -hmm. Good. One more. Okay. I'll say a little bit more about exactly what that, what that stress might be. Um, but there is one message that I want to get across to you about stress. If you remember nothing else, remember this. Stress is not what happens to you. Stress is something that you do with what happens to you. And it's because people don't understand that, that they often take exactly the wrong approach to dealing with the stress that we all have in our lives. Let me say a little bit about myself. Uh, I came into the field of medicine and the field of health care in a rather unusual route. I was a mathematician. Uh, my real interest was in point set topology. I really enjoyed how to transform one space into another mathematically. The other thing is I'm one of the early, early computer programmers, having begun with Fortran 4 back in 1962. But one of the things that brought me into medicine um, was an interesting experience that happened to me when I was in studying biology. I looked underneath the microscope and I saw, for the first time, the one-celled animals that were living there. I had never really seen that before. This is a paramecium. Actually, this is two paramecium's uh, doing something called conjugating, in which they exchange information between each other and so enrich each other's lives. And when I looked at these one-celled animals uh, underneath, underneath the microscope, I felt a strange kinship to them. They were alive, and I was alive. And therefore, I had some kind of relationship to them. And every day, whatever we were studying biology, I kept following up on all these little microorganisms that I had in a, in a little bowl on my desk. Then later on, I studied comparative anatomy and embryology. And that's where I saw the similarity of all of life, starting from the very first life forms up through the vertebrates, up through the mammals, and through the, the human being. I could see this gradual development, this gradual expression of this incredible life force making itself more and more available until, of course, it gets to the crowning achievement, which is the human being with our brain, with our ability to visualize things that are not actually physically present, which thereby gives us the ability to create things that do not yet exist. And one of the interesting things about all forms of life is they must maintain balance from that very first life form. If balance falls off, then the life force gets weaker, and pretty soon symptoms and pretty soon illness begins to occur in the animal. Everything from the first living cell all the way up through the human being, homeostasis is crucial, that we must maintain balance. So that if the, the, if the membrane uh, of a paramecium is injured, then that paramecium has to close that membrane so that it can continue to maintain an environment inside that is balanced with respect to the outside world, that it can pump ions in and out so that it can empty its waste products, take in oxygen, and so forth. And so therefore, Maintain maintenance of life requires healing, and healing is, by my definition, essentially restoring wholeness or moving on to a higher level of wholeness and completeness. 
In order to do that, then, the paramecium and every other animal has to continue to sense what's going on within. It has to continue to sense what's going on outside. And it has to have a way to respond to what's happening around it and what's happening inside. Without that, it won't be alive very long. Then I became a physician back in the 60s. And the fascinating thing, and the reason, reason then I went into, into medicine was after seeing, really having this, this sort of uh, breakthrough, this Ken show of, of awareness of life, then I looked at the field of medicine because and when you get to a certain point in mathematics, everyone becomes very dry. They're not very interesting people. And I'm a person who I like to sing, I like to dance, I like to play music and have fun. Most mathematicians didn't really like that. But here was this field of medicine. And whereas every other field of science that I had studied had gone through a transformation in which we realized that the world no, does not really resemble the Newtonian Cartesian model very well that since uh, Bell and Einstein and Heisenberg, we realized we needed a different model for the world. And yet the field of medicine still was looking at things in the old way. The field of medicine thought that people were simply collections of parts. If a part breaks down, then you just fix that part and everything's going to be fine. And so we got more and more specialists, and we have specialists that deal with every part. So you, it's not even a heart specialist. There's a specialist who deals in the left auricular appendage, and, and that's all. So you have more and more specialists, and every specialist knows more and more about less and less. So ultimately, you know absolutely everything about absolutely nothing. <laughs> but what I began to realize was that there was something that people could bring to the party that medicine seemed to be unaware of. I began to notice that when I worked with my patients, if I was talking to a person about their knee and what they needed to do in order to take care of an injury, if I placed my hand on their knee, and if I just visualized in my own mind that person's knee being well, and instead of just talking to them about the different things that they could do to help this knee heal faster, I would begin to speak to them talking to them about what they would be able to do in their lives, how well they would be able to run, how comfortable they were going to feel. And my patients got better much faster than they did before I did that. So I then decided I was going to take another look at medicine. And so colleagues of mine, this is around 1970, 69, 70, we developed the concept of holistic medicine where we saw the human being as a system, kind of like Russian dolls, nested within each other. So I'm a whole system. And in order, to, but to, in order to operate, I need all of these subsystems within me. I have organ systems that need to be operating well. I have my circulatory system. I have my respiratory system. I have my skeletal system. I have my muscular system. I have my immune system. I have my digestive system. And I need all of those in order to really function well, to be whole, to be healthy, to be happy, and to achieve what I want to achieve in life. And each of those systems is composed of groups of organs. And each organ is a sub-subsystem. And each organ contains cells and so forth down the line, systems within systems. And in the same way, I'm a whole individual, but here's my daughter over here. And if my daughter is sick or unhappy, well, she's back there. <laughs> if my daughter is sick or unhappy, I don't feel quite so whole anymore because I am an element of another somewhat larger system called my family. I'm an element of another system called the team that I work with at work. And my team is part of a larger system, which is the company as a whole, which is part of a larger system. And ultimately, we are up to the level of the planet as a whole. That's how a holistic viewpoint focuses on the process of developing wholeness and, and healing. So what I want is deep healing, which is for each level of system to be operating effectively and efficiently and operating, um, communicating well with systems 
that it's a part of as well as the systems below it. Information flows from the lower levels of system up and must come up and be clear. And then control flows from the upper systems down. Of course, as you move up the hierarchy, there are emergent qualities, the most exciting one of which is awareness, consciousness, that leads to the potential for still greater wholeness, which we then call creativity. I realize that most of the illnesses that we have in the world now that we have to deal with are not traumatic diseases. I don't know when I've seen tuberculosis. I haven't seen malaria yet. Rheumatic fever you don't see. Unless you're in a specialized trauma unit, most of our problems are not caused by bullet wounds or stabs. Most of our problems are caused by the way that we react to the things that are going on within our lives. Our bodies react in such a way as they produce illness and disease within. Our emotions react in such a way as we become unstable. This instability causes us to not be able to think as effectively and efficiently as we want. Our creativity and our productivity begin to go down. Those challenges in our lives, our way of reacting to them, causes us to not take care of our relationships. So now we begin to create problems in that system of which we are a part, which of course then comes back and creates a problem for us. What we see is the result of people not eating well, which is not a problem here at Google from my, from my tour. <laughs> it's like eating too well might be the problem. People don't do the exercise the way they should. Why not? That doesn't make any sense to not exercise. People drink more than they should drink. They smoke when they shouldn't be smoking, and on and on and on. These are the illnesses that we are approaching. But the way we're approaching them is using an outmoded paradigm. Because the medical system, I found, was treating things the way the rest of our culture did, according to this old paradigm, this bipolar paradigm of duality to say if there's something wrong, there's something bad, and that bad thing is at fault, and we should attack that thing that's at fault. And so off the field of medicine, as I found it, you treated with drugs or you treated with surgery. You were against something, antibiotics, anti-malarials, anti-hypertensive, um, um, what, whatever it might be, anti-muscle spasm. So you're constantly looking at it in that way. But you cannot see the totality of the human being in that way. There's an old uh, Sufi story about the ants and the pen. Some ants are crawling along a page, and they discover some writing. And they say, wow, this is strange. Looks like a whole bunch of ants run together. And pretty soon, they find a point of a pen. And they go, ah, now we know the cause for that writing. And then they move on, and they find the pen. They find the hand moving the pen. So now we know the cause for that. And then in time, they discover the wrist and the arm and the shoulder and so forth. And as the saying goes, that by proceeding in this way, one, at some point, the ants may discover everything there is to know about the mechanics of writing. But by proceeding in this way, they will never be able to understand the meaning of the words that are being written. And this is the situation I found medicine in in the 1960s and the 1970s. So I said, OK, this is for me. We just need to bring in some new information, and we'll have the same transformation in the field of medicine as we had in all the other sciences that gave rise, for instance, to atomic power, because you can't just explain atomic power using a Newtonian model of the universe and so forth. And there were some things now that needed to be addressed in medicine that could only be discovered if we shifted to this, to this new paradigm. So the, most of the illnesses that we suffer from, whether it's physical, emotional, mental, behavioral, or relational, are really due to how we're dealing with the world. Another little story. Story of a, of a samurai who came to see this wise man in, in Japan. He said, I've come to see you because they say you are the wisest in all of Japan. And I want to know the answer to a question. He says, very well, what's your question? He says, I want to know the difference between heaven and hell. 
And the wise man looks at him, starts to smile, <laughs> starts to chuckle and says, you, a samurai? Somebody who goes around killing for a living? You want to know the meaning of heaven and hell? <laughs> well, a samurai gets really ticked off. He draws a sword and says, prepare to die, monk. And the old man says, ah, that is hell. And the samurai goes, and he says, and that is heaven. It's right there. It's not last week. It's not next month. It's right now. That's the truth of it. And it's how you look at it that makes the difference. Your perspective. Well, in order to be healthy, our paramecium has to continue to sense its internal state. It needs to know whether it needs oxygen. It needs to know whether it needs more glucose. It needs to know whether it is what, where its acid-base balance is. And so it is cleverly designed with sensors within in order to reveal that information. To read the information and then be able to respond to it. It's well equipped. And every animal is at least all the way up to us. But what's happened really in the last few years or the last few centuries, if you wish, maybe even the last couple of thousand years, is this enormous growth of what we laughingly call human civilization. And what we've created is a world where we are surrounded by pressures and stresses that nature has not yet had time to deal with. If human beings are still around maybe a million or two or three years from now, we might have a sensor within that says, OK, your stress level is getting a little bit higher. And then we would have some response mechanism that would tell us what to do. But we don't have that now. Therefore, those, the only people who are really going to be able to survive and thrive and do well are those who are able to use this conscious mind the conscious, intentional part of the mind to address those issues that as yet don't come bundled with the system that we, that we get. We do have sensors within, hold your breath for a while, and your sensor will say, hey, your, your acid, you're getting more acid in your blood. That's the first drive that makes you go, <gasps> to have to take a breath. But if you hold off for long enough, then pretty soon there's a sensor that says, now you don't have enough oxygen. After a while, there's a sensor that will tell you, you need, you need more, a higher level of blood sugar. So you have these sensors within, but we don't have that stress sensor. And just as you need to build a sensor if you want to discover whether or not there's too much mercury in your salmon or too much radiation coming from the ground under your house, you have to use something that's created by this level, the conscious intentional level of your mind. So then what is stress? A scene at the vet, I think that uh, has something to do with stress. Dog is feeling it. Again, we, so we talked about, we talked about that, uh, that process of, of evolution. Hans Selye is the one who came up with the concept of stress. Stress is the nonspecific response or reaction to a perceived demand. Uh, and, he, and stress itself is an intangible thing. Uh, maybe the best definition I heard for stress is someone said, stress is the internal tension that you feel when you tighten up your muscles to keep from punching some jerk in the nose when he really deserves it. And in a way, that's not a bad, <laughs> bad definition, maybe not general enough. But stress itself is something that's intangible. We cannot see it directly because we don't have a sensor. We can only tell if stress is there by its symptoms. In the same way as you can't, you can't watch an atom or an electron do something, you can only see its trail on a film. You can see its footprints, but you can't see it directly. But we can see, we know that stress is there as a result of the symptoms that we see within. Most people, if you ask them what stress is, they seem to have some idea and can answer that question. 
for you. Um, but if you look at their lifestyles, you often find that the way they're living their lives, it doesn't look like they really understand what stress is or somehow they don't care what stress is. Or maybe somehow they're not fully informed about how dangerous it is to allow this to continue to accumulate within. And, and the funny thing about stress is it's not something that comes on and you get it bang and it's really painful because you don't have a, a sensor, but it builds up and it accumulates within you. Uh, and we think we can get away without treating ourselves well, but that's it's like the fellow I heard of who took a course in psychology and decided he wanted to train his horse to live on, on less food. So every day when he put the feed bag on, he'd give him a little less food, a little less food, and everything was going well as he tells the story. But then he says, you know, right at the point, he got him to the point where he was trained to live on nothing. It's 3 o'clock. The thing up and died on him right at that point. And that's what happens to us. We continue to deny ourselves too long, and then we don't achieve. We don't get what we need. So what had happened was Hans Selye was told that for every symptom, for every damage within the body, there's a specific cause. For every symptom, for every illness, there's a specific disease. But he found in working with lab animals that no matter what stress, stressor he placed on the animal, he would starve the animal or he'd give him poison or he would run the animal too fast in a, on a treadmill or uh, he would give the animal an infection or frighten the animal or expose him to cold. No matter what he did, he always found that there were lesions that were the same. They were bleeding into the adrenal glands and so forth within the body. So he went to his professors and he says, well, wait a minute. This seems to be a response to, to many different things. And the professor said, well, we're not interested in that. We're only interested in damage to the body that comes from specific things. And that's where Hans Selye began his work, to talk about and discover what stress might be. And he came up with what's called the general adaptation syndrome, which means that a person's going along at a certain level of stress. Nobody's ever completely stress-free except kind of like when you're sleeping, almost you're stress-free because you need a little bit of stimulation, some demand, or your whole system just falls asleep. Uh, and you probably know if you're, if you're reading a book, it's a really dull part of the book, you can barely keep your eyes open. You get to an interesting part and you're right on it. So you have this level, then alarm comes along, and that is a signal to your system. There's something threatening. There's a demand that's being made on you. Then you go into this alarm phase, everything gets called out. The muscles tense up, um, different organs of your body react different ways. You begin to secrete adrenaline, muscles tighten, that sort of thing. Um, your immune system goes into action because your system doesn't know what's going on. It just knows there's a demand. And it figures out what the problem is, and then it says, oh, I see what it is. We've got a streptococcus that's beginning to infect us. So it says, okay, the rest of you guys go home. The immune system, I just need you. Natural killer cells, I need you. And some B cells, why don't you come out? And then at that point, this fades away because you don't need it anymore because now the person with the answer to it is working on the problem, just like you. <sighs> well, at least I've got somebody in to fix whatever's going on. And then you come down, you recover, and you're, you're back, to, back to normal again. So so to see how things happen in this way, I say, it's a good idea to look back. Again, as you see, I always take an evolutionary approach to things. Because if you want to understand how we work inside, your looking at other animals and looking at our evolution can give you the most, most important information. So, so what we want to do is let's go back to a time that's, that's really early on. Uh, let's back to the days of the caveman. So here's a caveman. He's fast asleep in his cave. <laughs> 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 
Pretty soon the sun's coming up outside and the birds start chirping, creep, creep, creep. Ah, uh, he's a very relaxed kind of guy. He doesn't, you know, not many predators are after him. It's a pretty easy life. And ah, uh, it's morning, and uh, his stomach says, whoa, whoa, whoa. He begins to, he doesn't know he's hungry, but suddenly he begins to think about these blackberries that were almost fully ripe yesterday down by the water. Oh, yeah, and the flowers are so pretty this time of year. So he's getting stimulated now. Oh, yeah, and then he remembers there's this little cave girl that usually comes down to bathe in the morning. Now he's really interested. So he goes out and he's walking along, but his system's calm and he's happy and he's smiling. He's thinking positive things. So he's not paying too much attention to himself, to his environment, and suddenly he hears a noise and he looks and he's just walked between a hippopotamus and her baby. Not a good thing to do, not a good thing to do. And the hippo starts to charge him. So at that moment, all of those thoughts about the cave girl goes away. The stomach no longer growls for food because the body shunts the blood away from the stomach. The blood pressure goes up, the pulse goes up, respiration goes up as he begins to pump out as much carbon dioxide as possible because this is the fight or flight reaction. He's either got the fight this hippopotamus or run away? Which one does he choose? That's an easy question, that's easy. That's why we're called homo sapiens, because you choose to run. And so he's running and he feels anxiety inside and his mind is racing. It's racing, it's thinking about every hippopotamus he ever saw and he sees a tree and he thinks of every tree he ever saw. His unconscious mind does at any rate and he realizes he's never seen a hippopotamus climb a tree. <sighs> So he climbs up the tree, and the hippopotamus, hippopotamus comes and kind of roots around at the trunk a little bit and kind of walks around, and he realizes, hey, that thing can't climb trees. Whew. Ah. So his creativity saved him. The stress was necessary to bring out this creativity. But now he's sitting in the crook of the tree, and now he calms down again. His breathing slows down, his muscles relax, the hippopotamus wanders away, forgets all about him, he begins to think about the cave girl again and the berries, he climbs down in the tree and goes about his business. And that's the way things used to happen back in the old days. But we're no longer there. We live in a different environment. And today, today's caveman, is not awakened by the chirping of birds and light coming through the window. He's lucky if there's any birds left in his neighborhood now. Bang! It's the alarm clock that goes off. Oh man, it's morning already, I can't believe it. Harold, don't forget to pick up the so-and-so and so-and-so today. Oh no, she wants me to go there, I don't want to have to go there. And his stress level begins to rise. And then he gets up and he realizes, oh my God, I'm, I have that presentation this afternoon and I've still got a glitch in the program. And so he begins to tense up and he's running downstairs and he runs his to, into his teenage daughter who says, Dad, I'm getting my nipples pierced today. And his stress level runs up even higher and he runs down and he has a cigarette and drinks a cup of coffee, each of which raise up that stress level within him even more. He runs out and he jumps in his car and drives out onto the freeway and there's no hippopotamuses but there's cougars and jaguars and pintos and hummers and 18 wheelers <laughs> and he hits work and there's three new things on his desk and the boss says, step into my office. Up, 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 up. A very different kind of environment from the kind of environment that our bodies were so efficiently and effectively evolved to deal with. The result of that, obviously, is the imbalance. The first kind of stress, don't make me put the bone back in my nose, acute stress is finite, short-lived. The demand comes from an easily identified source. It's in the present. It's not like, oh, there may be a hippopotamus next week. Or, you know, have you seen the Dow Jones, what happened to Hypnopotam? No, it's not like that. <laughs> it can be resolved by analyzing, being creative, reacting immediately, usually through some physical activity, which is why retained stress shows up in our body as physical disease so often. 
So here is the stress recovery cycle. It's a little bit changed, but almost the same as Hans Selye comes up. Here's where there's a demand, what we perceive to be a demand. That doesn't mean there's really, doesn't mean there's anything wrong. Yeah, you're sitting at night, you're alone in the house, you're reading a great mystery book, everything's great, and suddenly you hear the door slowly creaking open behind you, and immediately in your mind, you remember, oh, there were three robberies. Oh, yeah, and, you know, and, you know, somebody got really beat up in one of those robberies last week. Maybe that's somebody coming in the door behind me. Your pulse goes up. <laughs> you start to breathe like that. Your muscles tense. Your body gets ready for fight or flight, and you spin around to find out it's just your cat that's pushed the door open coming into the room. So you just suffered this increase in stress, even though there was nothing wrong. It was all, in a sense, all in your mind. It has to do with perceived demand. Now, so you perceive a demand, then there is a reaction, and then an interesting thing happens down here. Have you ever almost been like an automobile accident or your car spins out or something like that? What's the first thing you do when you realize, I'm alive and everything's OK? <sighs> That's what you do, and for a minute or two, you don't do anything else, the same where the caveman just took a break. That's what happens here. This is called a relative refractory period. Every organ in your body works the same way. Your adrenals work that way, and that's why you get jet lag, because you're trying to go out and do some work when you're in a refractory period. Uh, your heart beats, and then it relaxes. And if you're trying to cardiovert someone, if you give someone shock in the emergency room, if you shock during the refractory period, you can throw them into a fatal arrhythmia. You're not supposed to be doing things when, when you're down here. Try swallowing fast six times in a row. Then, and all of a sudden, you can't. Because the stress of swallowing is followed by a, a, re a, a, a relative refractory period. Uh, how many of you have had sex? No, I'm just kidding. If sexually you see it's the same thing. There is this rise in stimulation, in erotic tension. There is orgasmic release, and then, unfortunately, there is this relative refractory period that some of you may have noticed. It happens, it, you can go through all the organs of the body. This is the way it happens. And it happens for us overall, as individuals, as teams, as companies, as nations and planets. We have to restore that. That's the piece. That's the crucial piece. So here's the caveman. Here's his encounter with the hippopotamus. OK, a couple of days go by. Oh, there's an avalanche. Oh, but we got away. Ah, oh, no problem. Oh, an invasion by the tribe next door. But we fended them off, and so forth. So, it keeps changing, but there's always a chance to recover, and therefore you maintain right along that balance line. That's why cavemen are always so happy. Now we get to the 21st century. I just copied this one from Reuters a couple of days ago. That people who felt stressed by 9-11 had twice the number of cardiac incidents three years later, that is heart attacks, raised blood pressure, and so forth. The stress of our day. Aren't you glad you don't work there? Now here's, this is a meteor. Now this is, this is a stressful situation. <laughs> but it's short lived. Whoa, miss me. Well, I guess that's it, because the meteors never fall twice in the same place. So this can actually now be the most relaxed guy in the whole neighborhood. This is type one stress, no problem. <laughs> Going out boating. This is a stress. Is this a type 1 or a type 2 stress? Well, if this little blonde lady manages to get out of the car, it could be just a uh, type 1 stress. But if she makes this mistake an awful lot, then she'll have a lot of stress that she carries around with her. And then there's the, the news that we have to encounter every day. Uh, this, is, this is the world that we have. We just, insecurity. Lots of things are, are, are pressing on us. Lots of stresses. 
This is Employee of the Month. Not here, of course, but this is what the world is dealing with, so. 21st century stress, accumulated stress. It's future-oriented. It's intangible. It's primarily social stressors. And the thing that happens is the stressor, the stress is what you do with what happens to it. There's no clear response. You know, there's no clear response. You know, should you get out of the stock market or should you buy while everything's low? This, it's not clear. And this stress accumulates within us. We do well for a time and then we crash. Very different from, from the type one. So here's our 21st century caveman. You know, here he wakes up and this is the daughter with a nipple piercing and then this is where it goes on. And at a certain point, you begin to get symptoms. Now, if you measure with the sensitive instruments that we have now, even here, you can detect that things are off balance. That's called, medically, we call that a sign. You have a sign of something going wrong. <laughs> then we get up to here, and we call these symptoms because you can actually experience them. Wait. Let me go high tech here. And so for this particular person, they first notice some tension. The next thing they begin to notice are headaches. Next thing they notice, they're snapping at people. Next thing, they're having trouble sleeping. Next one, they become allergic to it. Next thing, they get an infection that doesn't go away, and so forth. And this is what usually brings us in to see a doctor, to see somebody to say, I'm suffering from a disease of stress of some kind. How many diseases are related to stress? I tried to uh, just list a couple here. Yeah, just a couple. Just a couple. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. In fact, it's really kind of difficult to find a human illness that isn't either caused by stress or made much worse by poorly managed stress. Okay. The stress reaction then is being mediated by a part of our brain that is not immediately available to us. To make a really, really schlocky metaphor, it's like that stress is that something that happens with information that is there on the hard drive. And you can't hold all of it in your RAM. You can just get a little tiny window of what's going on there. But really, it's that unconscious part of the mind, the one that has evolved for low these millions of years that's carrying this out. Whether or not you feel stressed is not only due to the fact that something's out there, but also how you're interpreting it. How you're interpreting has partly to do with what you've brought to the situation genetically, partly to do with your beliefs, what you've learned in your life. Um, and that, that is all stored in your mind. That is what interprets what's happened and will interpret things as being a demand. The things that ordinarily save us now, these reactions of the unconscious mind, actually make things worse. Here's why. If, if, a, if a muscle sustains a little bit of injury, let's say you stick it with a pin or something like that, the muscle contracts, right? And that's normal. And usually, that saves us. But let's say what's going on is this person is under a lot of stress, so to speak a lot of pressure, and they're working and working, trying to finish this thing, trying to finish it, trying to finish it, and they tense the shoulders muscles like that, and they stay tense, and they stay tense. Well, eventually, this prevents oxygen from reaching the fibers that are in the center of the muscle. Those fibers in the muscle begin to show damage. They begin to release prostaglandins, which are irritants, which create pain it's stimulus to the muscle. So what does a muscle do? What muscles are trained to do? It contracts. That produces more damage, more stimulation, more contraction, and until you get a real spasm, and then you're in trouble. OK. That's, and physically, it's the same way whether it's, whether it's your irritable bowel syndrome, whether it's your gastro, uh, 
esophageal reflux, whether it's, uh, whether it's indigestion, whether it's asthma, whether it's low back pain, and on and on and on. They're all diseases of muscle tension, and the stress response makes them worse. Oh, let's, let's take something like uh, overweight. I met a woman who was very sensitive about her weight. She felt that um, because she was heavy, that that meant she was no good. She felt rotten about herself, and she got depressed. And when she gets depressed, she eats. And then she stands in front of the mirror, and she looks and sees that things are getting worse, and she feels even worse about herself, and she eats even more, and she looks worse. And so you get the vicious circle in that, uh, in, in that realm uh, as well. Uh, uh, and so forth. And so you can go through each of these, and I obviously don't have time to do all that. You can read more about it in the book. But it's those automatic stress responses that happen. And, and I say they're automatic. When you think about it, it's like I'm going to speak to you, and let's say before I get to speak to you, I say you're here because you're interested in what I have to say. You're good people. You're not here to do anything bad to me. You're not going to throw tomatoes or anything more harmful than that at me. So I'm really safe right here. My body is in no danger. But beforehand, oh, will they like me? Oh, no. What if I, what if I forget my lines? What if, I, what if I fall off the stool? Oh, what if the computer doesn't work? What if I don't have my power? Oh, not my power. Huh? And so I have stage fright, or I have social anxiety. So at the conscious level, I know that it's OK. At the conscious level, I know, OK, we finished that. Pro we'll see. We don't know if it's going to work. But in three weeks, we'll find out whether it worked. So I don't need to think about it. Instead, I'm up all night. Oh, I hope we don't fail. Oh, no, what if I do? I'll get fired. And, and so even though we know what we want to do, there's a part of us that responds in this other way, creating, creating the tension. So. This is where it was very useful that I understood computers. Because I realized that the human mind is very much like a computer, like a biocomputer. It's very complex, of course. But like any computer, the best way to deal with a glitch or a malfunction is to figure out how to teach the computer to analyze itself and to repair itself or to tell you what to do. And so I developed what I called software for the mind. This was in the 1970s. Nobody knew what software was. They thought it was like buying a rake with a handle that went wing, wing, wing like that instead of being a, a rigid rake. So the goal was to find a way to consciously and intentionally, number one, be able to pay attention to what's going on inside to develop a way to sense what the level of stress was, and number two, to be able to respond to that stress that's inside. In other words, we need to learn how to speak the language of the unconscious part of the, of the, of the, of the mind. And it's different. If I, if I say to you, uh, if I have a child, and I give the child a, you know, an ice cream cone, chocolate ice cream cone, I say, OK, now, don't spill that ice cream cone on that beautiful white carpet and make a great big brown spot that will spread and never come out. That kid is very likely to drop that ice cream cone. Not because they want to, but you've created that image in their mind. And their mind will just go and do it. <laughs> it's true. Some of you ski. Yeah, you're skiers. You know, like you're skiing. Say you're, say you're skiing through the woods, right? You're between the trees, and you're, you're, there's two trees, a narrow space between them. What do you look at? You do not look at the tree. You look at the space between the tree. Because if you look at the tree, you're going to hit the tree. That's the way the brain works. It's simple. So, you know, it also reminds me of the story about this fellow who goes to get a job uh, as, a, as a lumberjack. He arrives and the foreman says, OK, here's your chainsaw. We're cutting this 40 acres here starting today. What you do is you cut your trees down, cut them into 16-inch lengths, stack the wood up. I'll be back at the end of the day. See how many cords of wood you cut? And you get paid on the basis of that. The guy says, fine. The foreman comes back at the end of the day. The guy's cut down one tree. He stacked it very, very neatly. It was cut down well, but only one tree. And he says, have you been goofing off all day? And he looks. 
The guy's drenched with sweat, <sighs> exhausted. And the foreman says, well, maybe there's something wrong with your chainsaw. And he takes the chainsaw and goes, Grrr! the guy goes, ah, what's that noise? <laughs> That's the way it is for us. We don't remember to pull the chain. And for us, the pulling the chain is restoring that recovery period. This is so magical. This is so magical just to be able to do it. To understand first that it's important to do it. Number two, understand what damage is going to happen to you if you don't learn to do something like that. Number three, to develop a technique that you can, in fact, do that for yourself. So here's a little bit of practice with the brain. Um, what, what I realized is, oh, let me just ask you to join me in an exper experiment. I want you to think about a helicopter. Now think about a ballpoint pen. Now think about, think about the little toe on your left foot. Think about the Statue of Liberty. Become aware of your breathing. Listen to the sound of my voice. It's very easy for you to shift from one thing to another. Think about them all at the same time. Not possible. Not possible. So therefore, even though the mind has enormous selectivity, it has a very small capacity. Over any given period of time, the quality of the thoughts that you have during that five minute period, five day or five year period, those thoughts create images in your mind, and the images that you create in your mind will then affect the unconscious parts of your mind. That's brain language. Brain language is imagery. So I think we just have a few moments left, so I'd, I'd like you to do one more experiment with me. And that has to do with, let's see if we can restore that little recovery period, okay? So let your body be seated comfortably. And if you haven't felt a lot of stress in the last few days, you can imagine that you have, and that now you're giving yourself a moment to sit and do something about it. And then with your eyes, look at some point in the distance. Focus your eyes on that as though it's really important to do so. And as you do, you'll notice that everything else in the room fades off into a blur, and that's good because the only thing that you want your mind focused on is what you are intending for it to be focused on. And then become aware of the fact that at this moment in time, there's no other place that you need to go. There's nothing else that you need to do. And there's no problem that you have to solve. And therefore, you can give yourself permission to relax. And as you do that, you may notice your eyes begin to give you signals that they would like to close. And if it feels more relaxed to let your eyelids close, close them now and behind your closed eyelids. Let your eyes gently roll upward till you're looking at the back of your forehead. And imagine that there on the back of your forehead, you can see the word relax. Or if you like, you can imagine an image that represents relaxation for you. Imagine that you can relax your eyelid muscles all the way down to the point they just don't want to open at all. And when you feel that relaxation in your eyelids, gently test them. And as you test them, let the relaxation from your eyelids flow throughout the rest of your body. Imagine little ripples of relaxation flowing outward from your eyelids into your forehead and your scalp. Feel the muscles of your face relax. As your jaw muscles relax, you may notice your upper and lower teeth gently drifting apart. Let the relaxation flow down into your neck and your shoulders. And as that happens, you may feel your shoulders gently falling away from your ears a little bit. Every little relaxation of your body is echoed by a relaxation of a neural complex within your brain. Let the relaxation flow down through your arms and your elbows and your forearms and your wrists and your hands, down to your fingers. And as that relaxation reaches the tips of your fingers, you may feel a kind of a, a warmth or 
uh, tingling or a pulsation. Notice how it feels. And then when you feel that relaxation in your fingertips, take a deep breath in, draw the relaxation from your fingertips up into the center of your chest. As you let that breath out, let it be a feeling of letting go completely. Like a balloon letting go all the air. And then let the air do the breathing for you. With each breath, imagine you're breathing in relaxation. With each breath out, imagine you're breathing tension out of your body. Feel your chest back and your lungs relaxing. And let that relaxation flow down into your abdomen and your lower back. Feel the rising and falling of your abdomen like a gentle massage of relaxation to all your internal organs. Let that relaxation flow through your pelvis, relaxing all your pelvic organs down through your thighs and your knees, your legs and your ankles and your feet, all the way down to the tips of your toes. Good. And become aware of the fact that at this moment in time, there's no other place that you need to go. There's nothing else that you need to do. And there's no problem you have to solve. Therefore, you can give yourself permission to relax even more deeply and double your relaxation. No matter how relaxed you become, you can always become more relaxed. To do that, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to open your eyes and close them again. And as you do, feel your relaxation doubling over what you have now. Open your eyes and close them. Good. And feel your relaxation doubling. See that little symbol of relaxation on the back of your forehead, and when you can feel that doubled relaxation in your eyelids, gently test them. And as you do, let the doubled relaxation flow throughout the rest of your body. Warm, soothing, peaceful feeling, all the way down, right out through the palms of your hands, right out through the soles of your feet. As your body grows more relaxed, you become aware of the unnecessary thoughts being generated by the unconscious levels of your mind. Unnecessary thoughts, because there's nothing that you have to think about now. Unnecessary thoughts are like doubts, concerns, worries. Comparisons, judgments, thoughts about the past, about the future. You don't need to do any of that right now. In fact, right now you can become aware that the past does not exist. Not even one second of the past can ever exist again. And therefore, you're completely free to let go of any unnecessary thoughts about it. The future doesn't exist either and never has. Everything that exists is right here in this moment in time. And right now, at this moment in time, you are in the only place that you can possibly be. And you are the only person that you can possibly be at this moment in time. And so you can allow yourself to be at peace. Just as at peace as if you were in a very, very comfortable place. Maybe a beautiful place in nature. Maybe a place you've been before, a place you'd like to go to. And you can imagine yourself on a magic carpet of relaxation, floating through time and space. And imagine yourself perhaps at a beautiful beach. Maybe you can feel the sand beneath your feet. See the color of the sky and smell the fragrance of the ocean. Feel the cool breezes, the warmth of the sun. Or if you like, you can go to a mountaintop 
or to a beautiful garden filled with colorful flowers. You can be surfing or skiing wherever you might like to be, any place far, far away from anything that could ever disturb you. And any time any unnecessary thoughts come along, imagine those unnecessary thoughts are like words written on a blackboard in your mind's eye. Then as you test your eyelids, imagine you're drawing a wet eraser across your mental blackboard, erasing the unnecessary thought and sending another wave of relaxation flowing throughout your body. If another thought comes along, you may race it in the same way. More and more relaxed and more and more comfortable. And notice your breathing. You're breathing in and then there's a letting go and then there's a little pause after you breathe out and before you breathe in again. Let yourself sink deeply into that pause. It's the quietest time of all for all your mind and body. Good. And as you erase unnecessary thoughts from your mind, you begin to notice fewer thoughts and more spaces between your thoughts. Let yourself sink deeply into those spaces between your thoughts. And imagine yourself in a very peaceful place place far, far away from anything that could ever disturb you, and think to yourself the words, I accept myself exactly as I am. With each breath out, I accept myself exactly as I am. Good. And become aware of what you really care about. What has meaning in your life? What do you value deeply? And do you feel a sense of mission in life? Does your life have a purpose or is it meaningless? And if so, become aware of your purpose. And become aware of those that you work with in your work team. And think about the common purpose that you have with them. Think about what you have in common with a company that you work for. Think about what you have in common with all the people and all sentient beings on this planet and perhaps beyond. The more deeply you can be in touch with those, the more of a commitment you will feel within yourself. There are three things that protect against stress. The first is being committed. A second is having control, which you do now because anytime you notice stress building in your life, you have a way to come back into relaxation. And the third is you do not see obstacles in life. You see challenges. And for you, challenges are opportunities to bring forth your skills, your gifts, your talents. Imagine yourself going forth in life. Imagine yourself seeing your obstacles merely as challenges that you enjoy overcoming. Imagine yourself bringing forth the best that is within you. And imagine you can see an image of yourself in the future, a year from now, or six months, or one month, as far as you'd like to go. See yourself looking completely happy and healthy, dressed the way you'd like to be dressed, doing something you'd really like to be doing, in a very pleasant place. Step into that image and become that person. Feel how it feels. And as you do, you're letting the deeper levels of your mind know what your goals are. Letting the deeper levels of your mind know who you are and what you want to work for and to move towards. Good. Now keep that feeling with you and bring yourself back to an awareness of the space around you here in this room. I'll just count from one to three, do it gradually. One, reorienting to the day, the time of day. Two, be aware of your surroundings. Three, when you're ready, let your eyelids open. Take a deep breath in, let it out, and take a moment and notice how comfortable you feel. So that was a little high speed touch on what we're talking about in terms of that place of relaxation. For some, this was easy. For some, it was difficult. 
if it's difficult, it's nothing that can't be overcome with a little bit of practice. Practice makes perfect. Do we have time for questions? Oh. Well, I uh, got a little mixed up on my time, which is a stress that I'll go home and torture myself about tonight. But thank you all for being here. Hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you.